Welcome to those who've joined us this evening for the Wandsworth Together on Climate Change Festival. We've had a whole range of events already this week. We had a really relevant um, webinar this morning about air quality um, and we've had a number of different things about transport as well, which obviously links really closely to this event on electric vehicles. Um, my name is Annalisa Allen Norris and um, I am the policy and programme lead for climate change and sustainability at Wandsworth Councils um, and I'm joined today by two great speakers. Um, the first is Ollie Ely from Senex um, and the second is Paul Booth from Ubertricity. Uh, you might recognise Ubertricity um, because there's lots of Ubertricity points all over the borough. Um, and if you don't recognise them, it's because they're really tiny. Um, but I will hand over to Ollie first. We're going to take some questions at the end. So if you do have questions about either of the presentations, please do stick them in the chat. Um, we'll pick them up as we're going along. Otherwise, feel free to raise your hand at the end um, and we can take some questions in person. So without further ado, I shall pass on to Ollie. Hello, good evening everyone. Um, let me just share my slides for a moment. You just bear with me while I do that. Um, So hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, as uh, Annalise said, um, I'm Ollie Ely. Um, I work for Senex um, in the sort of uh, energy systems and infrastructure department. Um, and uh, yeah, today we'll be talking about sort of the vehicles, uh, charging electric vehicles and some of the sort of common myths and misconceptions. Um, first of all, a bit of context about Senex. Um, we were sort of set up in 2005 by the UK government uh, uh, originally, uh, sort of, we were fully funded by the government, but now we are independent and not for profit. We run as a sort of uh, research and technical uh, organisation. Um, so some of our work is research and development that's funded, and some of it is sort of consultancy. Um, and we we work uh, with, with public and private sector clients across sort of longer, multi-year projects as well as short-term consultancy work. Um, we also have a number of uh, international partners and um, that, that sort of Senex Netherlands is a is sort of a separate organization to us but we work um, in, in conjunction with a lot of projects same goes with Senex Korea and we also run uh, LCV which is the one of Europe's largest uh, low carbon mobility events so to give you a bit of context about the sort of projects that we do um, this is a project that we did with, with Nottingham City Council a case study from our transport team uh, effectively, this was uh, part of, in 2015, part of the work to encourage electric vehicles in their area. Uh, it covered three different areas, uh, the um, sort of charging network where they expanded um, that, that sort of within the city, uh, as well as a public engagement project that sort of did, did events very similar to this one. But um, the, the, the ULEV experience was sort of a third of that, that funding and it focused on business support. So we sort of orchestrated that project. Uh, it, facilitated the loans of uh, electric vehicles to local businesses, uh, it facilitated grants to local businesses for infrastructure um, and undertook fleet reviews, which is sort of an assessment of the uh, company's uh, fleet and, and how they can switch and, and what the sort of most cost effective way to do that is. Um, an example from the energy team is uh, a lot of work we do around vehicle to grid. So you, some people may have heard of this, but it's relatively cutting edge technology. Uh, it basically involves um, charging yeah as as you would expect you know electric vehicles charge from the grid into their own batteries um so that you can use that energy to drive around but vehicle to grid uh, involves allowing that energy to flow the in the other direction back into the grid and um, you might do this for a for a number of reasons uh, either to sort of uh, fill your car with renewable energy that you've generated in your house and then discharge it back into your home or into the grid when when sort of prices are higher um, or, or sort of there's there's lots of disaster applications. So if your home is cut off from the grid, you may be able to power it from your car. Um, and there's a lot of sort of grid balancing uh, uh, benefits to this as we have more renewables uh, as part of the uh, sort of energy mix. Uh, 
Um, so to give a bit of context on, on why we're here and why electric vehicles actually matter and, and why the switches need at all, and I'll sort of go through some of the environmental concerns that have, that have got us here. Um, a, a lot of you may have seen this image before, as some of you may not have. Um, this, this is a, a visual representation of the change in global temperatures that we've witnessed over the past, I think, uh, around about 100 years. Uh, each sort of visible li uh, vertical line uh, represents the temperature that year or the average temperature that year, global temperatures. And as you can see, sort of the right hand side being the present, um, there has been, you know, a, it's, it's quite a striking image when you when you realise that, that the situation that we're in and how much needs to be done sort of as soon as possible. And sort of this idea that it is an emergency. Um, yeah, so, so in terms of the actual figures, the current research shows that, you know, one and a half degrees, uh, which is the current target um, for, for, to sort of limit uh, global temperature rises, that will actually create irreversible climate change. You know, we're aiming for what's, what's even the ambitious one and a half degrees does, does there will be effects. You know, we're at a stage now where we need to do everything we can to make sure to limit those effects um, and sort of protect people. Um, and yeah, this means cutting CO2 emissions by 45% uh, by 2030, um, which is still a very big challenge and, and current commitments don't necessarily get us there. So if you've been watching any of the COP26 news, um, we're not quite there yet. So uh, yeah, it's really important that we have events like this to sort of get people on board with the agenda. Um, in terms of the local authorities, uh, over 300 UK councils have now declared climate emergencies, uh, including Wandsworth. So, um, and then that covers over 50 million people. So the vast, vast majority of the population of the country live in an area that, that has, has, has declared this as an emergency. Um, so all the councils that have said this need to be undertaking very sort of forward thinking and, and, and fast acting policy in this area if they're to sort of keep to their, to their promise. Um, but it's not all about climate change, uh, air quality, as, as there was a sort of session earlier today that Wandsworth ran. On, the, on this topic, uh, is this a very serious problem in the UK, particularly sort of in, in urban areas such you know such as sort of Wandsworth? Um, yeah, as you can see there, you know, living with within 50 metres of a major road increases the chances of all sorts of different types of cancer. Uh, there's lots of research on this if you want to sort of go out there and, and look at more of it, but um, it, there's a very high sort of risk to to yourself and particularly to younger people and to children. Um, from from poor air quality, so it's something that really needs to be tackled. Uh, in terms of the vehicles, uh, sort of why electric vehicles might be the question. I mean, there's lots of people out there that are aware of hydrogen vehicles or, you know, improving the efficiency of current ICE vehicles. And um, the, the, the fact is that um, electricity is the sort of area where we, we, we find it best. Uh, we will we most quickly be able to sort of reduce the emissions from creating that energy. So by making vehicles electric, uh, an electric vehicle, there's a lot of talk about them sort of being fueled by coal power, and we'll get onto that a little bit later. But effectively, as the grid gets greener and greener, and it, it sort of has done very, very fast, as you can see, 38% reduction in CO2 since 1990. And as that continues, sort of your car on your driveway, if it is electric, will be green the, the next year and the year after and the year after until sort of we have a green grid and entirely green sort of electrified transport system. So uh, that's sort of the plan. Uh, just, just to give you a context of the, the national government policies and, and why this is sort of it is happening now. Um, earlier this year, the government announced that the ban of the ban of on the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles uh, will be brought forward to 2030. Uh, and then sort of hybrid by 2035. So, you know, th that's not a particularly long time away, uh, particularly, you know, that might be one cycle for certain people, depending on how long you own your vehicle. Um, for a lot of people, their next vehicle will be electric and understanding that the challenges is really important. Uh, yeah, so there you go, how will residents adapt uh, and what's required to facilitate the shift. Further to that, yeah, there's just a few more sort of headlines that, that have been around um, in, in recent years, and you can see that it's a very much accelerating agenda. Um, if you really want to get into the depths of the policy, which you may not want to, 
the Road to Zero is quite a lengthy document that the government published um, a couple of years ago. And this goes into a lot of detail of all different areas of transport. Um, but it, it sort of shows that there's a holistic view um, to sort of achieve uh, all of the uh, environmental targets in the transport sector. Um, and a lot of it relies on electrification. And then further to that, there's the transport decarbonisation plan, um, which is another sort of uh, report that you can look at if you're so interested. The low emission zones as well are a very big sort of emerging uh, policy trend, uh, particularly if you live in London, you'll be aware that the uh, London low emission zone will be expanding um, and sort of that just gives you all the more incentive to change if you live in the area. Um, OK, so now I'm just going to go through some of the different charging equipment um, and, and just try and give a context uh, prior to uh, Ubertricity's talk on, on sort of what is out there and on what are the technologies. Um, so as you can see, there are actually a huge amount of charges in the UK, uh, more than people might think. Um, it's grown very rapidly in, in the last couple of years. Um, so we've got, uh, as of June 2021, we've got 42,000 different connectors. Um, but it's important to say, you know, it has grown rapidly, but uh, there is still a lot more to do and, and the capacity and the type of charges that are out there need to fit with the areas that they're in. So that's a lot of the work that we do to sort of facilitate that. Um, this sort of gives you an idea of the, the, the amount of sort of provision that's required to meet the growth in the vehicles. So um, a, a report that was done by the ICCT showed that you would need a 31% year on year uh, increase from 2019 to 2030, um, which is an absolutely huge challenge. Um, so yeah, all the support we can get from, from different local authorities and from the private sector with Ubertricity and then the companies like them, you know, is, is really important because there's a big, big challenge there. Um, in, yeah, in the 2020 budget, there was a lot of sort of uh, headlines made of, of people needing to be within 30 miles or a rapid charge point. Um, I think people in the industry perhaps were, were a little bit uh, confused about this at the time because um, the fact is that within 30 miles, the vast majority of people are within 30 miles, but the more important thing is that these sites have enough capacity and have enough points um, that, you know, that if they want to go visit it, there will be a point free and they don't have to queue, which is something that we are seeing more and more now these vehicles are becoming ever more popular. Um, there is an array of public charging networks um, and uh, accessibility has previously been a problem in terms of having to have different cards and having to have different accounts. But um, the good news is that most of them do provide contactless payment. Um, and I think we'll get onto it a bit later that this is actually being mandated by the government. So. Um, accessibility for these sorts of uh, this sort of equipment will, will, will be much improved down the line. Um, and there are a range of costs uh, for the public network, which is in, an important thing to sort of understand. I think a lot of consumers at first when they buy an electric vehicle might not realise the range of costs and, and the sort of the different prices for different types of charging. Um, some, some suppliers up to 69p a kilowatt hour. If you only charged at, at sort of those top end rates, would probably end up costing you more than in, in a diesel or petrol car. So it's important that you know, you're know you charging at home where you can. And if you live off street, if, if you have parking off uh, sort of on street and you don't have off street parking, um, having that ability to charge your car at an, a lower tariff and not having to use the full public network is really important, particularly in areas like Wandsworth that perhaps have a lower rate of uh, off street parking. Um, these are the sort of uh, things that are sort of uh, on trend recently, these large uh, forecourt style charging hubs. Um, these can be incredibly effective for dealing with motorway charging and sort of uh, trunk route charging. But uh, yeah, as I said, the rates of, of sort of uh, charge, the prices will be will be significantly higher than, than the average here. And it's not the sort of you hear a lot of people saying, you know, why can't we just charge up my, why can't I just charge up my car as I do my uh, petrol car? Um, you probably wouldn't want to do that uh, because, yeah, you wouldn't see the cost savings that a lot of electric vehicle owners do see. 
Um, so yeah, this is some information about the um, sort of uh, open protocols that are being put in place, uh, sort of contactless payment um, and the requirement not to have not to have any sort of app or, or sort of registration wall uh, for all charge points is, is is being rolled out, which is really important because um, you know it's it's up to the private sector to encourage people to have accounts and have apps and, and offer perhaps reduced rates for that. But uh, for the network to work efficiently, it needs to be open and accessible to all. So this is a, a table showing some of the connectors. Um, effectively, yeah, the top two are, are um, uh, there's obviously a lot of use cases for different different things. The top one is not recommended. Um, this might be sort of a trickle charge or an emergency charge that might come with your vehicle. Um, mode two, it's not recommended. Well, it's not recommended as a permanent solution. Um, but there are lots of uh, uses for this this sort of technology that, uh, particularly if you don't have uh, off street parking, you may want to use this for for a, a more permanent solution. As long as you have you know the correctly rated uh, cable and it's all sort of up to code, then it's not a problem. Um, mode three and four. So mode three would be your sort of range of uh, fast uh, charging. So that would be sort of anything from uh, seven kilowatts to 22 kilowatts, which is um, probably charge your car in, in a matter of a few hours, um, sort of maybe maybe two to three hours. Mode four um, would be sort of rapid charging, um, and this could be up to sort of 350 kilowatts, um, which uh, is the sort of yeah motorway or forecourt style services. Um, yeah, so there you go. That gives you sort of an idea of the uh, speeds and the miles of range you'll be getting per 20 minutes of charge. Um, ultra rapid is increasingly sort of replacing rapid, um, but there are still very few of them around at the moment. Obviously, there's a lot of issues to solve around the sort of reinforcement of the grid to facilitate such high charging rates, but the vehicles are sort of a little bit further ahead so there's a fair number of vehicles out there now that can accept these higher rates and then it looks like that'll be the new standard. So hopefully the charging networks will sort of catch up with that. Um, so yeah, this gives you some of the idea uh, or some of the things we discussed earlier in terms of the charge points. You know, you, you can have a, a range of different installations from a, you know, a wall mounted, which is the most likely uh, technology if you have off street parking. This is the sort of thing that you would have and it wouldn't be particularly expensive. Um, sort of 500 pounds with installation to a thousand pounds, something like that. Um, floor mounted, uh, this is might might be where you would see, um, you know, a, a public car park, a fast charger, um, a destination where you might be parked up for a, a few hours. Um, and then sort of rapid chargers are much larger units. You would see them, yeah, it's sort of the place, uh, service stations and forecourts where you're only there for sort of up to 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and, and the same goes for ultra rapid. Uh, and then wireless charging uh, is an area where we do a fair bit of research, but currently, uh, yeah, it's in it's in sort of early stages and, and the costs uh, and the practicality of having it as a home solution are probably not really uh, worthwhile right now. Um, yeah, so this gives you an idea of some of the prices um, as little as 300 pounds for a wall mounted, um, floor mounted, obviously significantly more. Um, rapid 15 to 30 and then sort of ultra rapid it's not quoted on here but um you're probably looking at double uh, a rapid so that they, they are expensive units but um yeah the, the costs are coming down for all of these sort of over time uh, in terms of the types of charging and sort of locations you have the new off street and on the street um yeah i think it's fairly self-explanatory but just gives you some images to give you an idea of, of, of what's out there um, and, and what these sort of units actually look like. Um, yeah, and there's a wide range of sort of different units that fit into each of those categories out there. So, you know, these are sort of an example of a pillar and, and a wall mounted. There's some more innovative solutions that sort of pop up out of the ground or sort of have low lying um, um, units that sort of are more flush with the, with the streetscape. Um, and then obviously we have the uh, lamppost charging solution that Ubertricity um, sort of rolled out over much of London, and this is obviously quite a discrete solution, um, and, and 
based through the cable so sort of it, it has very little aesthetic impact on, on the streets which is important in some of the heritage areas um, and then to finish off i just thought i'd go through some of the key myths that we hear and maybe preempt a couple of questions uh, that people might have um, so we often hear electric vehicles are more expensive than petrol and diesel equivalents so although that is currently true um, there are lots of people that uh, can see a cost saving uh, right now so uh, if you keep your vehicle for sort of five years and you do 16,000 miles a year then it, it, it's likely to be cheaper and then you know if it's six years and 13,000 a year then you would likely see a saving now um, so lots of people are saving money by, by switching already um, but as battery technology improves the purchase costs are sort of coming down uh, very very quickly so by 2025 that's the sort of current prediction for price parity with petrol uh, and diesel vehicles. So, um, you know, even if you're looking at it now and you think it doesn't stack up, by then, uh, for the majority of drivers, it should, uh, should represent the saving. Um, electric vehicles don't go far enough. So, yes, 10 years ago, this was definitely the case. Um, I mean, I, I know people that have been in the industry since the beginning and have, have, have owned vehicles that do 50 miles range and it was very difficult to convince people that it was the future then but um, that, now we have vehicles sort of typical electric vehicles of, of 150 to 300 miles um, you know there are, there are 300 mile range vehicles in the region of 30 35,000 um, you know 250 miles at the mid 20,000s it is it's certainly at the cost people are buying cars now that there are a lot of options out there that, that are very practical and, and you look at the average daily mileage that people do, um, the range anxiety sort of issue is, is not what it once was. I think generally people should not have a problem. Um, a lot of concerns about the reliability of the battery. Uh, obviously, it represents a large portion of the cost of the vehicle, um, probably more as a single sort of part, as it were, um, uh, than, than petrol and diesel vehicles. But manufacturers are very confident in the technology now. They've done a lot of research. Um, and yeah, they offer very long warranties of seven or eight years and, and 100,000 miles on sort of a lot of their vehicles right now. So you, that gives you the confidence if, if you're, that you're sort of worried about that. Um, the worry about uh, climate change effects and, and, and sort of the grid, we sort of touched on this earlier. But um, just to give you an example, you know, in, in, in 2020, 43 percent of electricity generated in the UK was from renewable sources um, and I believe it was it was 40 percent the year before so it, every year it's sort of increasing as, as more uh, renewable energy comes on online um, and we're expected to reach um, sort of 100 percent eventually uh, and, and but even now at the, those rates of renewable energy um, yeah switching to an electric vehicle will reduce your transport carbon footprint by 70 percent um, and then finally, yeah, charging electric vehicle takes four to eight hours. Um, as we've discussed, there's a whole range of technology now that will charge it much, much quicker than that. Well, yeah, thank you very much. That, that sort of covers all the areas I went through. I realise that's probably a lot of information if you weren't so aware of, of, of the industry and things, but um, I'm happy to answer some questions at the end. Cheers. Super, thank you very much, Ollie. Um, so lots of topic areas covered there, um, lots of fascinating stuff. Um, before we take any questions, I'll pass over to Paul to go into a little bit more depth about um, what we're doing in Wandsworth specifically um, and some of those charge point options that, um, that you picked up, Ollie. So, Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, Ollie, I have to say that was fantastic. Um, you covered a lot of ground there from you know, the, the grid to types of vehicles, types of batteries, types of charge points. Um, so really, really enlightening. Thank you for that. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, good. Um, I'm working off two screens. So if I look at the camera and then look away, it's because the information is on this screen. So don't be distracted. Um, we've got your um, we've got your kind of slideshow screen rather than the slides in full themselves. OK, let me just click on that. Better? Better. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. 
Uh, yeah, so thank you um, and thanks for the invite um, to the event. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, is that thing that's someone else joining, is it? No. Yeah, okay. we've got it. We've got a new attendee. Excellent. Press Good on, timing. Paul. Great. Great, great timing. Um, so, yeah, just a, a brief introduction um, from me. I'm the sales director at Ubertricity. Um, I'm also joined by a colleague, David. So, happy to take any questions that you, you may have after we've gone through some of this presentation. And I'm starting with this uh, slide here with uh, the electric neighbourhood um, of Wandsworth. Uh, as you can see, and as Ollie alluded to before, uh, there are a number of charge points that we already have in Wandsworth. Um, and Annalise, you mentioned before that some people may have seen them, some people may not. And the reason for that is, as you say, we, we have some fantastic technology that goes into the existing infrastructure. Uh, currently, we have 125 charge points uh, in Wandsworth. Um, and if we look at just a bit more detail here, this is an example of what piece of, one of the pieces of kits looks like in the lamppost. Um, and it's designed for its uh, providing electricity ev everywhere for everyone is, is the mission statement. Um, and the focus for Ubertricity really is looking at the, the problem that's created by people not having driveways effectively. So when we're looking at, at people being encouraged to move from ICE vehicles, so traditional fuel vehicles to battery electric vehicles, most people like to charge at home uh, overnight. And if you haven't got a driveway, then then what do you do? And Ubertricity uh, goes a long way to, to sharing uh, the pain with that and the problem that ensues. So we enable EVs to park uh, charge, charge wherever they can park uh, on streets. We make EV charging convenient and affordable, which Ollie alluded to and going through the different types of charge points and, and the cost structure there. We work very closely with local authorities because that's the existing infrastructure that we work with. Um, and we're trying to integrate the, the EV uh, into the, the technology that we, we have, um, which is based uh, or developed in Germany where our, our head office is. So we're a German based company, came into the UK uh, two years ago. Um, so if we just look at what we do is we do utilize what's there. It's discreet, uh, described as charming, whether that's true or not, we we'll get some feedback on that. Um, but it's a low cost solution. It's very easy to install. There's no extra street furniture needed, um, and it, it just utilises that existing structure there. Um, and where where the lamp post is, say at the back of the street, we we have a bollard which goes at the front, still feeds off the power supply from the lamp post. Um, so from a, a grid perspective, it draws existing power that's available within the lamp post. So. It's, it's, I guess, protecting the, the grid and allowing more space available for more rapid charges, which draw more electricity from, from the grid. It's, it's easy to use. Um, we have a, a smartphone uh, app. Um, I'll show you an example a little bit later on. Um, in fact, I'll just go to the next picture here. This is an example of uh, one of the lamp posts in use. As you can see, it it just sticks out of the lamppost. So if you walk past it and nobody's charging, you, it's, it's sometimes difficult to know, is, is that a charge point? So we have a, a QR code that's attached further up the lamppost. So it is discreet. You know, we, we can market that uh, more effectively if, if we need to, but that's really at the discretion of the local authority um, to really be in keeping and blend in with the residential street there. Um, that's, so that's a lamppost there. This is an example of uh, the bollard, which I was talking about before, which still feeds from the lamppost. Um, so as we see, most lampposts have more electricity supply than the street light needs. So it's, it's within that existing infrastructure there with existing wiring. So from a, a, an installation perspective, it takes between 45, 60 minutes with no real distress to the pavement or digging up any um, any groundworks for additional cables. 
um, and it, it trickle charges as we call it so it's quite a slow charge designed for that overnight use um, at 5.5 kilowatts so when Ollie was going through the range it's at that slower end of that range um, which is fast enough to, to fully charge a, a, a good size battery so a 60 kilowatt battery overnight um, or if you have an hour spare two hours it can give you enough top up to, to have that daily commute which is generally between five and, and 15 miles as we see and the reason that um, we, we like our product and, and councils like our product is it avoids situations like this where we've got some um, very creative methods of, of charging from from the home, um, which we don't encourage. And from a council perspective, isn't encouraged either because from a health and safety perspective, uh, it's certainly, certainly not something that you want to do. It's a trip hazard. Um, as you can see, some of them are trailing on the ground, some of them are, are, are above height going from, from windows. Yeah, and the gentleman just here is, is actually designed his own, own little um, concoction to try and avoid that trip hazard, but ultimately it's, it's, it's not practical. Um, so we, we like to feel that Ubertricity, uh, we solve the on-street challenge um, or the charging challenge. Um, home charging is critical really for, for many people to decide to move from an ICE vehicle, so an internal combustion engine vehicle, to battery. Um, and, and we help solve that problem for the local authorities by utilising the existing infrastructure. Um, and, and that's really, in a nutshell, uh, you, you stole a few of my other points, Ollie, so I won't go through a lot of what you went through, but that's, you know, that's great. Uh, I'm so happy to throw it open to any any questions or any comments. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, that's great. And there's a lot of ground I think we've covered. Um, I've got a, a, quite a few questions written down here, um, but I don't know whether there's anybody um, who has any questions who's on the call at the moment. Um, I can see there's some typing going on in the chat, but in the meantime, um, I mean, where shall I kick off? So I think one of the things that I, I, I'm actually an EV driver myself and I've been I've been driving EVs for quite a while. Um, but I remember when I was sort of starting and um, and a lot of the things I see on the forums that I'm part of as well was uh, people ha seem to have a um, the perception that they need to kind of fill up their cars all at one go. So you get down to kind of 20 percent of your battery and then you have to go up and you have to you have to fill your battery all the way. So is it kind of possible to go and do a little bit at a time? And, and I know, Paul, you mentioned that charging overnight is ideal for the lamppost charges that you've got. But what happens if I just want to drive into Wandsworth because I've got a meeting or I need to go there and I, I'm not a resident but I might come for shopping or whatever it is um, and I just want to plug in for an hour like can I do that and how much how much range will I get from that like how many extra miles would that really give me? Uh, uh, shall I take that first Ollie? Um, it's a, a good question and, and it's a bit it's a bit like the mobile phone experience isn't it? We, you, do you ever let your mobile phone go all the way down? You, you tend to just keep topping up don't you? And I think the, to, to move more towards electric vehicles, we need the infrastructure to cover all different ranges. So we need the slow chargers that we can be kind to the grid overnight with Ubertricity. With your example, Annalise, if you want to go to a supermarket or your, your hotel or get you out shopping, you, you want to be able to top up. And, and I think that's the habit we need to get into is Try and find somewhere where you are, top up, and then and then move on when when you're finished. And in terms of the range that you get, it's really dependent on the size of the battery that you have and the size of the the, the charger that you're utilising. You know, you'd get much more out of a, a rapid charger than you would if it was a seven to to eleven, twenty one, twenty two kilowatt charger. Um, and the Ubertricity charge point you wouldn't really use as a top up, but 
by all means you would use that um so if you're a taxi for example you could do that several times a day and that would be enough to get you around your local area so it's, it's more of i think a change of mindset and habit than a traditional vehicle where right an e-fuel you go to the service station you fill up and so that process continues whereas it's the flip side you, you try and charge at home where you can but then if it's not practical you top up as, as you go so yeah i mean just to, to add to that um i think it, it, a lot of the, the behavior of a lot of electric vehicle owners sort of once they're have owned the vehicle for a little bit of what a little bit of a while can can, can sort of change so a, a lot of drivers that i know might might it, the reason that overnight charge is so important is that people most drivers enjoy starting the day with a full tank of fuel i mean if you had a petrol car if you started every day with a full tank of fuel um you may never need to sort of you wouldn't need to worry about fitting uh, sort of a, a refuel into your day so a lot of the range of the vehicles now that you know if you're you've got a 150 mile range the vast majority of days over 90 percent of days that you you leave the house you won't need a charge so it may be that you go to a car park that has destination chargers, but if you if you don't need one, you probably won't charge. You'll probably just park in a normal spot, do your shopping, and then sort of go home. Um, so those destination chargers are increasingly for people who have travelled further to the destination. Uh, now, obviously, it's a bit different. If you can't charge reliably at home overnight, you become more reliant on the rest of the public network, um, which isn't ideal. So I think that's why it's really important in, in parts of London that Ubertricity do provide this service um, because otherwise the owners won't be able to sort of yeah have that benefit of having a full sort of battery every morning. Yeah, and that's actually I think you picked up on it um, earlier in your presentation. Obviously, in Wandsworth, we um, we we don't have a huge amount of off-street parking. Lots of people in flats, so actually the the provision of so many of these kind of trickle charges on the street. Um, is is great because it enables people who don't have a garage um, to sort of charge up overnight um, and charge up little bits at a time as well. Um, I think one of the things that I, I I came across in a forum not like long ago was does your does your battery drain if it's just left on this on the street if the car's left on the street for a couple of weeks whilst you go on holiday and um, well and, and whilst you do say that see that on a phone for example um it loses like a couple of miles of range or something but essentially the entire range of the battery is still there if you just leave it and do nothing to it um that actually links to the um there's a question in the chat from joanne um i heard um range anxiety is a worry um so how do you find charge point outside of the borough so that picks up on the you know great we've got loads of provision in the borough but not everyone's just driving around ones worth um so how are we kind of finding charge charge points elsewhere and presumably we're not just looking for ubertricity we're looking for this whole range of charge points um so i don't know ollie you're probably yeah yeah to start with that one. i mean i think yeah as far as um finding the charge point i suppose the first half and um, there's a lot of sort of apps out there and Google are starting to incorporate this data in. Um, we actually run uh, at Senex for a number of years, we've run the National Charge Point Registry, which is a database of the location of different charge points around the UK. We run that for uh, OZEV, who are the Office of Zero Emission Vehicles, part of DFT. Um, and they're looking to sort of improve the data that, that's part of that. So uh, have live data for charge points, you'll be able to see if it's available. And we've done one or two projects that you can read about on our website about uh, booking of charge points. So if you know you're going somewhere, you can look if there's a charge point there, you can book a slot and things like that. So all of these technologies developing just to make it a little bit more, a little bit easier when you leave your home base um, to sort of find a charger and to use it. Um, in terms of uh, range anxiety, I think it, it's, Range anxiety seems to be a problem for people who don't have electric vehicles, but not much of a problem for people who do. Um, I think that's the thing that I've observed a lot. So uh, obviously, before I drove an electric vehicle, I was exactly the same. Uh, I, you know, it's a natural reaction to uh, some of the things that you hear and particularly some of the press, perhaps, <laughs> around around the vehicles. But um, I think once you once you have a vehicle and the current ranges that, that are on them now, it, it's more for longer journeys, very rare longer journeys where it, you actually do experience any sort of range anxiety. Um, and that's why it's so important that some of those sort of faster networks 
and motorway network charging uh, where there's sort of a big challenge to provide what's actually needed um, is, is sort of funded but uh, it looks like sort of the government and the policies behind that um, and I think that it's an area where the private sector will will probably step in because the most money to be made in the charging network is, is with rapid charges basically as we discussed they have much higher um, per kilowatt prices um, and even though the units cost a lot more the business model stacks up very very well for them so as long as it's enabled by the government and by policy I think those long distance sort of charging networks will, will, will be uh, sufficient. Yeah, and actually, Councillor Cuddy's picked up a really good point about those. I think one of the things that I use is that map when I'm, do, especially if I'm doing longer journeys and I'm not familiar with the area, and, and Zap Map's a great tool for showing you all the different speeds of charges that are available and what networks they're on and um, how you can pay for them, whether you can use a, a debit card, for example. Um, but it's only some of them that actually do give that live data of whether they are, you can see whether they're available, but sometimes they've had issues with them. And sometimes it'll say a month ago, somebody reported that there was a problem, but you're not quite sure until you get there um, whether it's actually going to work yeah, and it's, they, it's they, do, they do have these issues, don't they? And, and but, I, but I know some of the companies like GridServe seem to be getting over that. Yeah, it's important to say that the, the, the policy that um, has, is dictating sort of the, the uh, openness of the payment systems um, is also dictating the openness of the data. So charge points, uh, public charge points and public networks of charge points now will uh, from, I think it may have already come into place, will have to have uh, be smart in the sense that they can receive and send data um, including whether they're being used or whether they're online and, and this sort of data is, as the network grows will become sort of the majority of charge points will, will provide this data and apps like ZapMap um, and Google Maps and, and other things that sort of receive this data will be able to display that to you um, so yeah it, it's there's an interim period now where you know you're, you're right it, it can be annoying when you get to a charge point um, particularly some of the older networks and, and the reliability issues are there but yeah uh, it won't be much time until sort of you'll have, be able to judge your journey a lot better. Yeah I agree and, and it's a, an element with that is in the in interim is how quickly the companies react to get that back up and running again so that's certainly something at Ubertricity we we work really hard to provide that customer service to make sure that with the energy transition and encouraging people to move to EV, we want to make sure that these charge points are working. It's fundamental to them uh, accessing that network and having a, a ha hassle-free charging experience. Yeah, and actually, I think one of the great things about the Ubertricity network locally is that there's loads of them as well. So if you have the odd one that actually isn't online, there's normally one of the lamp posts down. Um, talking of those, is there, um, do you need like a card or anything for the Ubertricity ones or do you just rock up and you just park outside it and you can see, I've noticed that they've got the green and blue lights on them in, in yeah. our lampposts. Um, yeah, so there's a, a QR code Annalise on, on the lampposts or the bollard, so you, you use your smartphone, scan the QR code and simply take, takes you through that journey, uh, put your card details and it, it pays you go effectively and it remembers the card details for next time. Or, or you can actually use the, the Shell Recharge app um, so you don't need to scan that. And when you open the, the, the app itself, it recognises which charge point location you're at and then the, the same process effectively goes through but the, the actual app rather than uh, the Ubertricity website. And actually, you don't need off. You don't need the off-street parking. You don't need a space or anything like that, do you? In the in in ones with the with the lamp posts, you just you can use them if you're a resident or not. Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. Um, super. Um, there's another question around. It's an interesting question. Um, is there a link between areas with high numbers of charging points, um, driving higher levels of purchases of electric vehicles um i don't know whether I, um, ollie do you have any figures on I'll, that i think it's very, it's probably very complicated as an answer i don't yeah. think there's a very clear consistency with it there's a lot of factors that 
determine sort of how uh, I mean you have two things there you have the, the propensity for people to get an electric vehicle which has a lot of social and economic drivers um, but then on the, on the infrastructure side um, there are a lot of sort of business case drivers so obviously areas with a lot of EVs private sector will want to put more charges um, but if that area has a hundred percent off street parking um, then the business case probably won't be that good because all of those people will just charge at home. So, you know, in, in a lot of areas of London, you have, a, it, one sort of being one of them, you know, you have an area where um, there's a relative affluence and, and sort of green disposition that means that you have high EV ownership, but you have low off-street parking. So that's sort of, I guess, where Uber Tricity come in, where, in, in terms of provision. Um, yeah, it's difficult to. It's not a simple relationship, basically, but um, you can sort of see there some of the factors that are at play. Yeah, and I think you can see a correlation of a higher proportion of EV owners with access to off-street parking because it's easy for them to charge at home. So the flip side of that is where we come in. You know, what we'd like, what we're trying to do is get that infrastructure built up to solve that problem of lack of access to off-street parking so that by definition then it drives the behavior of people looking to then feel more comfortable about moving from an ice vehicle to a, a battery electric vehicle so that will take time um but i think we'll we'll start seeing a shift change very quickly you know over the next 12 to 18 months yeah and i think a lot of the the points that were raised earlier about national policy and there's actually very much a drive by central government at the moment to put regulations in to, um, to effectively like push the market in the right direction, yep. isn't there? Um, yeah, uh, I've, I've got a few more questions. Um, I'm thinking more about the vehicles now rather than I suppose the charging, but obviously all vehicles come with different sizes of batteries and things and the bigger the battery the, the further you're going to go but the the batteries themselves do you know, they do degrade a little bit over time um and we don't want loads of these batteries hanging around um and how do we dispose of those and things so i wondered if we could touch on what happens with batteries after they've been in cars like what do we do with them do they just go in landfill um or can they be used for other purposes and and i suppose linked to ollie what you were talking about before about your vehicle to grid options is there kind of links to that like using batteries in homes um, and yeah. does that vehicle to grid technology mean that you know it, it'll make your battery degrade faster and you won't be able to use it in a home um okay so there's a few questions there <laughs> <laughs> First, first point on the batteries uh, in terms of uh, sort of after they've been in vehicles. Um, there's a huge amount of work to sort of develop uh, reuse cases for those batteries, um, but also where that's not possible to recycle some of the elements. So there's a huge demand for batteries elsewhere um, where density is perhaps not as important energy density is not as important as in a car so when it loses some of that capacity a lot of these batteries could be used in in grid scale batteries so um, as well as in people's homes the grid will probably require very large centralized batteries as part of the um, energy system in order to store energy when it's being generated by renewables but not being used um, which basically allows you to uh, move the peak of uh, generation uh, well it because the peak of generation may not be the same as the peak of consumption so we'll be creating energy when we can't use it so obviously between those two things it needs to be stored um, whether that's at grid scale or whether that's in your home where you have sort of a tesla power wall is the, is the one that everyone knows um, that allows you to store energy in your home um, yeah the, the, the batteries from vehicles are increasingly being used in those areas um, but we've also done some research around what they, they call the circular economy um, to sort of design the creation of the batteries so that when they go into a car, they're already built in a certain way that they're easier to recycle at the end. So it's thinking about that whole life cycle of the part. Um, so so that's, that's, that's important. And the other question was um, at the end about degradation. Yeah, so, so V2G, we have probably done more V2G research than any other single organisation probably in the world. 
And we do run the world's largest V2G trial, which is over 500 uh, domestic V2G points, I believe I'm right in saying. Um, the, the initial research from that is that the effect on battery health is negligible and potentially positive. Um, as long as you're cycling within uh, the sort of safe, sort of between uh, 20 percent and, and 80 percent charge in that sort of middle period and, and v2g systems des are designed to, to not go beyond that um then then it can it can actually uh it sustain battery health now the number of cycles there's a lot of different elements that mean you know sometimes that's not always the case but but v2g is not inherently damaging to batteries um but this research is just making sure we understand what types of behavior are and aren't and make sure that the, the technology is used in the right way. Super, and I suppose actually with the V2G type um, applications, like if you had vehicle to grid charging at home, you could, if you had charge point at work and you were using your car to go to work, you could drive to work, charge your car at work, come home and actually use the power that's in your battery yeah. to power your home when you're putting all the lights on at 6 p.m. and you're putting it's your actually, hob on and things. It's actually an interesting. It's it's a, it's more of an issue, weirdly, because um, it creates that there's a whole tax piece and around this because obviously uh, there's a lot of rules around benefit in kind. Yeah. So theoretically, although no one, well, very few people have V2G chargers right now in the UK. Theoretically, if you had free charging at work, you could go to work, you could charge your car for free, you could come home and you could power your house off it. And legally, you would you would should be paying tax on that. Currently, there's there's no system to facilitate that. So, I mean, I don't think it's an issue that will stop the growth of the technology, but um, certainly an interesting one I, I, in terms of how that works out. I'm not a lawyer or a tax man, so <laughs> that's one of them. But um, <laughs> Yeah. We're getting very much into the, the intricate details of this, aren't we? Um, I know actually that benefit in kind is one of the things that's a really positive thing about getting um, company cars. If you've got a, um, if you're if you're thinking about getting an electric vehicle and actually um, a salary sacrifice scheme, for example, it op operates at work. Um, or if you're getting a, com a company car, uh, one of the massive benefits of choosing an electric car over um, a petrol or a diesel car is that you, you pay very, very little in the, in the way of benefit in kind. I think the rate is is it one percent from next year or one percent from this year? Yeah, it was it was zero percent last year and it goes yeah. up one percent a year from now yeah. on. Um, and yeah. it's twenty two percent or something for if you've got a, an equivalent petrol car so that that's that's a massive saving that you get isn't it um i think um yes there's one sort of final question um i'm conscious we've only got a couple of minutes left um so that so there might be a couple of other questions um i suppose how I've seen so many more people be interested in getting a car this year compared to a year ago. So I think a year or so ago we had, it was something like 2% of sales um, of new cars were pure electric. And obviously by 2030, 2035, that's going to be 100%. Um, and we're now at kind of 10 or more percent of new cars are electric. So there's obviously a really, there's obviously a real drive for people to, to move across to electric vehicles. But with there being so many more sales, like, do you think the infrastructure, and I think this is probably more a question um, for Paul, but but Ollie as well, you, um, do you think the infrastructure is kind of keeping pace with that now that that kind of spark has been ignited and you know people are, are getting on board with this and now it seems much cooler to have an EV and there's loads of choices out there and you know there's there's loads of different options if you want to have a massive car or a tiny car or a Tesla or um, a, a mini or you know a, a, a huge like SUV um is the infrastructure really kind of keeping pace with that um or do we not I think, quite know I think it's it, yeah it's, it's getting there and you know there's been it's not there yet, no. Um, but if you look at Ubertricity and the Shell Group, 
Shell looking at um, really how to be part of that energy transition with the acquisition of, of New Motion, a uh, Dutch-based uh, charge point company, you know, hundreds of thousands of charge points available now across Europe. There's the, the announcement a few weeks ago, uh, probably a bit longer now from, from the Shell group about Ubertricity that we'll have 50,000 charge points in place by 2025. And that's just through Ubertricity without the rest of the business as well. So there's a lot of ambition there, but that comes with the desire and the appetite to actually make sure we implement that infrastructure. You know, these aren't what we feel are empty promises. We just we just have to do that. And there are other companies out there that are also doing the same. So I think between between us and between our you know friends and competitors, we will work together to get that infrastructure out there in various different guises, whether it's in the lamppost, whether it's on in car parks, whether it's at, at motorways and service stations. Um, Shell have just transformed one of the, the sites in Fulham to a full EV hub, which has taken a bit longer, um, and that's because it's new. You know, it's, it's been a difficult job to get that, get all the cables in place, get the right amount of power there. Um, and it's taken a couple of years longer than expected, but that's the first one of its kind for, for Shell. Uh, other companies are doing the same. So, yeah, in, in short, it, it's getting there. It's not there yet, but certainly there's, there's the appetite and the desire to do so. And, and we need to do it. It's essential. Yeah. Ollie's any last words on that? Uh, no, I just hope that Ubertricity and, and New Motion... Uh, yeah, uh, a big part of that, that growth. I think it's it's that it does feel like an industry where sort of the private sector and, and the public sector are working together very closely and, and quite collaboratively. Yeah. Um, and it, even within the sector, you know, different players are happy to help each other out and understand that there's a real reason that we're doing this. It's not just a, a normal sort of business and a, a land grab, but they sort of everyone has the same goal. Yeah, yeah. and I think we're, we're seeing much more kind of integration of energy providers and charge point operators and car companies and things and trying to kind of bundle these things together like like what we have with mobile phones now that we didn't in the past mm. all these things are kind of coming together and being more sort of smooth and integrated and streamlined um so it's it's looking to, to my mind anyway it seems like a um a bright future and 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 one that's really worth sort of making that shift now rather than yeah. being kind of hesitant um okay well we've we've hit the hour but thank you very much paul thank you very much ollie for for joining us for this hour um you're both um you've got you're both coming along um to our final event which is all day on saturday in person at um Battersea arts center um we've got things that are not just electric vehicles as well so we've actually got a cargo bike there and other things to do with transport and active travel so we're not all about cars we're, we're doing lots of other stuff as well and loads to do with our biodiversity work and um, buildings energy efficiency um lots of topics that we haven't touched on here but we've touched on through the week and um, so i'll put a link in the in the chat to that um for cool. anyone who wants to come along on saturday um but yes i shall see you both there and hopefully um many people who are residents people who work and, and people who come and play in wandsworth okay thank you very much um and thank, thank you very much everyone for coming along and hearing this talk Cheers. Thank you very Thank much. You. Have a Thanks. good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.